If you know me at all, you know I am always talking about the light, getting the light environment right for your health and supporting your circadian rhythms. In fact, I think supporting your circadian rhythms is probably one of the most important things you can do for your health. So I am super excited to have Dr. Martin Moreed on the show. So he's an expert in circadian rhythms. In fact, he was at Harvard for 23 years as a professor and also in charge of the lab that discovered the super chiasmatic nucleus in the brain. So that's considered the master clock in the brain, a really important discovery. And what he's doing in this episode is talking about his new book, The Light Doctor. It's being rolled out on Substack, and it's really important and helpful information about, very practical information about what happens when we have the wrong light at certain times of the day. So we end up talking about cancer, obesity, diabetes, and of course, mental health, and how that's all impacted by having the wrong light. So our circadian rhythms get all messed up. And then we have all these health problems, but more importantly, what to do about that. So you'll let us know in the comments how you like this episode. Dr. Moreed, it is such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me. Well, it's a pleasure to um, talk with you, Kelly. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. Well, I, I got interested in circadian rhythms really seriously about a year and a half ago. And so I thought all this rich information, all this research, obviously the Nobel Prize in 2017, but when I listen to you talking, it's so great to hear back before anybody was interested in circadian rhythms, what it was like. So if you don't mind taking us back to how you got involved and excited about studying circadian rhythms. Well, I think my interest really got going when I was came out of medical school, graduated medical school, and I was going to, on a track to become a surgeon. I was doing a first year residency in surgery and a major teaching hospital. And I found myself working 36 hour shifts, 36 hours nonstop on my feet, 12 hours off to get some rest, back in for 36, back on for 12 hours rest, 108 odd hours a week. And walking around like a zombie as a result of it. And at that point, I noticed there were certain times, even without sleep, that I was fully alert. And other times I wasn't. And I was nodding off in the operating room. That's not a great thing to do when you're holding the retractor with the surgeon. And I was writing prescriptions I couldn't make any sense of the next day. So after a year of that residency, I decided to take a detour and really go and study these things that, you know, there was some work, there was some work on circadian rhythms, not very much, very few papers being published on it. And I decided to go and do a PhD at Harvard studying this. And as I was about to do it, one of the leading luminaries in science at that time, a professor at MIT, told me, you know, stay clear of circadian rhythms. It's this, you know, this is all hocus pocus science. It's no, nothing real. It's just to do with the Earth's rotation. And no one's ever shown there's a clock in, in any animal, you know, circadian clocks. You know, this this is not a good career for a young man. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a little bit like Howard Schultz and Starbucks being warned off to go and try to sell expensive coffee right by his father-in-law, so the story goes. The mm -hmm. same sort of right. story then. And yeah. I was sufficiently, you can call it uh, determined or pig-headed or whatever you want to call it, to say, no, I think there's something here. And that, of course, put me at the front row a seat in this whole area and nothing more exciting for a young scientist to have a wide open field everything to discover that's how I got going I know it's so and that was in the 1960s is that right that's that was that, uh, that was yeah yeah that was it was doing my PhD I graduated medical school in I ended medical school in the 60s I graduated in 1970 this was shortly after that about 71 or so as I was taking my detour down to Harvard and, and starting to do some research in this area. Right. So not that long ago is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, it's not long ago. Yeah, it seems like yesterday, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, really, in, in the scheme of things, which because circadian rhythms are so important, and I want you to, to tell everybody, 
I'd like to do sort of the first part talking about what are circadian rhythms and why this is so important for people to understand for their health. And of course, we have to talk about the supra, supra cosmetic nucleus, supra. I used to say super until I saw it supra. Uh, yeah, well, right? I, yeah, my favorite mispronunciation is super charismatic, right. which, you know, which is sort of, you know, it is super charismatic, but it really is the supra chiasmatic. So we, right. we're going to get people totally confused if we start playing with that. Thing. Right. Don't play with the word. Just SCN. SCN. That's right. SCN, yeah, that's SCN right. which is so exciting to be in the lab, to be running the lab, you were the head of the lab where you find the SCN. That's got to be so exciting and how important this is for people's health. And then maybe we could go into sort of some practicals for people, like how once they figure out how important this is, then maybe we can share with them how they're going to need to rearrange their life a little bit to make sure they're supporting their circadian rhythms. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, circadian rhythms are the changes in the body as you go around the clock around day and night. Uh, almost everything in your body um, comes to a maximum level, different maximum levels for different things in the body, whether it's your body temperature or the or hormones like cortisol or growth hormone, or it's you know your ability to learn, your ability to do exercise, your strength, your immunity. Almost everything varies consistently around the clock. So there's a, there's a time of day when it is most effective and there's a time of day when it's least effective. And that is tuned to the environment for, you know, the first, you know, generations of, you know, of, of humans for years and years and years we've been on this planet. And for the, all those generations, we lived in a world that was dominated by light and dark. In other words, we weren't designed biologically we didn't evolve biologically as night active animals we had a poor sense of vision at night compared to other animals a poor sense of smell and we just were not very competitive at night and hence sleeping in your cave was the best thing you could do try to stay out of harm's way but at night at daytime then we really are at our best and and able to see and function and hunt and, and all the rest of it that core function is you could do that just with saying okay the sun's shining now i'm going to get up but it so happens in the body and this is something i wrote some time about about is it takes some time for the body to adjust from one condition to the other it takes a matter of more than an hour for the eyes to adjust to darkness so you see with your rods rather than your cones it takes a, a time for your body to warm up and for the functions you need for daytime. So if you've got a biological clock, as we do, it, it can start the whole process before dawn. It knows when dawn's going to occur and it knows when dusk is going to occur. And so you can be ready. Your body can be ready to be fully active. And so we have a whole sort, uh, all sorts of systems in the body that are switching us and preparing us for either the nocturnal state or for the daytime state. And all those are called circadian rhythms. The key thing about them is when I entered the field, we knew that humans had circadian rhythms. That's obvious, sleeping at night and, and being awake during the daytime. But the the basic theory in the field was there was even even I, even after biological circadian clocks were found in rats and hamsters and other animals. The leading experts in the field at that time said, I don't think they don't think humans have a circadian clock like other animals, and they're synchronized not by light and dark, but by some sort of complex form of social interaction, very vague. Those were so fundamentally different from all the other animal species that we said, this doesn't quite make sense. So we did two things there. We were able to discover where the was indeed a, a circadian clock, a suprachiasmatic nucleus in the human brain. It had been missed. Interestingly, if I can just tell the story, one yeah. of my graduate students um, uh, at that time, Ralph Leidick, um, who's now gone on to be a distinguished professor at the University of Texas. But one of my graduate students said, wait, wait a second, the atlases of the human brain, where they literally take slices of the brain and show where everything is, are throwing away 49 slices in between every 50th one. So you only see every 50th slice. And so there's a lot of stuff in between. So he, for the first time, went back and every, looked at every one of those slices, and lo and behold, there was the SCN. It had been there all along. It had just been missed. 
So we're able to find where that was. And then with another one of my students, uh, a guy called Chuck Seisler, Charles Seisler, who's now a distinguished professor at Harvard, they are, it's one of the greatest things is having, you know, having your children and your grandchildren academically go on and succeed, right? right. But he, um, he, he was able to work together with a professor in New York called Elliot Weitzman, set up a, a lab where we can control time of day. Uh, in other words, you know, no windows, no clocks, nothing to tell the time of day. And now we can introduce various stimuli that might be synchronizing the circadian clock. And we, lo and behold, we found that indeed light and dark were doing it. In other words, humans were like other animals. Everybody has a circadian clock. Every one of those is synchronized by light and dark. And the there's a huge science of this in this area. And I was just reviewing recently the papers in the field, over 30,000 papers on the interaction of circadian clocks and light, and of course, multiple books and so forth. So it's a very well-established field. And it determines your life because... If you mess with Mother Nature, if you mess with your clocks, and, and another important thing is every cell in the body or virtually every cell in the body has its own clock. So everything in the body can get beat out of sync like an orchestra, a discordant orchestra with no conductor. The suprachiasmatic nucleus serves and synchronized by light and then synchronizes all the, all the clocks in the body. But if you get out of disorder with those clocks, they get out of sync with each other. So one is telling one time a day and one's telling another time a day, then all sorts of diseases happen. So, you know, the risk of breast cancer is accelerated, the risk of prostate cancer, diabetes, obesity, immune system is impaired if you've got disrupted circadian clocks, uh, your lifespan is decreased. You know, it's in other words, anybody who's worrying about lifespan, all these people worrying about good health and lifespan and longevity, if they're not controlling the circadian clock and not controlling the light in their environment and the right type of light, um, then, you know, it's, you're really missing the biggest part of the whole picture. And of course, we're not controlling the right type of light because we've just swung over into a total LED blue rich world, um, which is screwing up the message that our biological clocks rely on. Right. Exactly. And your book, The Light Doctor, I'm sure that we are going to talk about The Light Doctor because I've started reading it and I love that you're that you're rolling it out on Substack because it's just exciting. It's almost like a new episode coming. So we'll talk about that because you're covering everything in the book. You're covering all the all the diseases that are related to light, the research, but also in a very digestible way so that people can you know you don't have to go to Harvard to read this which is important because I think it's it's important that we spread this message because the research is there, but people don't seem to understand. They're living their, their lives in this modern indoor life. We are so covered up even when we go outside. We've got sunscreen and sunglasses and we're all covered up and we're just missing a lot of what needs to be happening that rich blue light from outside during the day and then blocking it at night. We don't want that sharp blue. So tell, tell us about what we do need and, and why. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a book. I mean, I've written scientific papers and scientific books mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. The yeah. problem in this field is uh, one person uh, uh, or oh, several people have commented is that the scientists know all about this, right? This is this is established science, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, even there's a Nobel Prize for heaven's sake in this area, right? right. This is very established science. right? And the scientists know, but as Dan Denneman, who heads a, a nonprofit group in about light, good lighting in, in Holland said, you know, their neighbors don't know. In other words, it, no, they don't talk to each other over the garden fence, as it were, about this. So the whole purpose of this book is to try to now blow it out because if only the scientists know about it, the you know that that that's doesn't benefit uh, the, the the world and everybody. This is something so fundamental and it's easy to explain and interesting to talk about and people love it and you can explain it in in a way and I hope I, hope, I think I'm doing it in in the light doctor that's really designed for just you know the average person who's curious about their health and well-being. So getting back to blue, here, here's the story. When we discovered that the 
circadian clock super charismatic news super charismatic nucleus the scn mm -hmm. was the core pacemaker in humans and it was synchronized by light and that was in the 1980s mm -hmm. we didn't realize at that time that wasn't any type of light a special type of light that would do it we just thought it just you know any visible light would be doing it what the big discovery was around the year 2000 was, in fact, we're much more sensitive to blue light than we are to the other colors of the rainbow. So that blue component, uh, sunlight and daylight and even our regular LED lights and everything else, composed of a whole array of colors. We never really see it because all we see is the white final result of the white or yellowish light. But it's got all the colors of the rainbow in it. But it turns out certain colors and the color that is effective, most effective, 25 times more effective than white light, is a sky blue color, the color of blue sky, which is kind of interesting. That's, that's that sounds natural, right? Very interesting. Yeah. And 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 it's interesting even more because that is the only color that penetrates the ocean depths. A staggering finding, right? In other words, Green gets absorbed, red gets absorbed, yellow gets absorbed, violet gets absorbed. But once you get down below 100 meters or so in the ocean, the only color down there is this blue, this sky blue color, the same color as the sky uh, as the sky is. But th therefore, the fish swimming down there and the creatures down there, the only thing they see during the daytime is blue, and then of course black at night. So clocks, when they evolved back 500,000 years ago. Those clocks in the Cambrian area of evolution, those clocks were actually responding to blue as the only signal. And all the apparatus, blue detectors, circadian clocks, even melatonin can be found in primitive animals, animals dating back, even single cell animals. It was the whole mechanism there of blue light being detected, the clock getting synchronized to it and then predicting the next day and using melatonin as the internal signal in the body to say it's dark outside. That's Melatonin is the darkness hormone. It's not the sleep hormone, by the way. You don't, Giving right. you normal levels of melatonin doesn't make you sleepy. So it's, it's got mislabeled, but it's the darkness hormone. That whole apparatus is there. So now what we running forward now, when this uh, the evidence started building of the huge health effects and the adverse health effects, breast cancer, 50 times 50 percent higher in women who worked at night for example prostate cancer obesity diabetes all that evidence started coming out particularly in the last um, about 10 years 10 15 years ago people that i was consulting i was consulting to a lot of industries that work 24 7 around the clock they said mm -hmm. we can't switch out the lights at night we can't stop work at night you rely on your oil, well, your oil industry or your petrochemical, your manufacturing, your airlines, your safety, security, hospitals. You rely on us being there 24-7. What do we do about this? And the discovery that it was blue became key. So what we did is say, okay, can we really narrow it down as to which exact blue color it was? And so what we found was it was indeed a rather narrow band of blue peaking around sky blue. And that happens to be also very close to the chemist, chemical in the in the eyes, the photopigment called melanopsin, which is detects this. That's around 480 nanometers in the blue. That type of blue light is really, as I say, 25 times more potent than other colors in the spectrum. Now, once you know that, then you can say, OK, this is going to be a bit simpler to achieve. We don't have to switch off the lights at night. We have to remove the blue. And so now that's what we got into. And part of our, you know, the invention that our group did was to recognize that one of the problems with removing all the blue light, everything uh, below 500, you know, all, everything in the blue violet spectrum was you end up with a ghastly amber, orange, yellow color, which is not very attractive and it really a rather depressing color. And what we realized is that, yes, we had to take away the blue, but we, we could replace it with violet chipped uh, LED chips and then provide no blue as a result. So what we're able to do and get the light white so we can make the light white again, nice color by adding in violet. And that was the real solution that we patented and, and then moved on to produce light fixtures. And that's what's being implemented today as part of the solution there 
Um, that's the exciting part of it. We, we're just on the brink of having what we, we already have established, and it's really becoming much more widespread, the use of light. We know exactly how much blue we got to avoid during the nighttime and exactly how much blue we need during the day, neither of which we mm -hmm. get with the, with the current LEDs. The problem with the current LEDs, they're neither good for day nor they're good for night. They've got not enough blue for the daytime hours to really synchronize the clock. You've got to get outside, quite frankly. The LEDs, well, the LED lights won't even relatively bright in the house, will not synchronize your clock for you. And during the night, you know, you've got to remove that blue. So th those are things we can now do and now solve by knowing exactly what the blue color is we need to manage. A lot of people have very mixed feelings about LEDs. One advantage of them is that you can, what's called spectrally engineer them. In other words, you can pick your color array and you can design exactly what are the, the bands of the spectrum of the color spectrum, the rainbow spectrum that you're going to have in the light and what you're not. And you can balance them out and create white light. So it's a malleable technology. The trouble is what's being provided today is the cheap, harsh, blue rich LEDs, very cheap to make, they're very energy efficient. Energy efficiency is great. I'm not, I'm certainly a pro um, trying to manage our climate issues, but not at a cost of our health. And in fact, there are far more health problems today that directly relate to the blue LEDs being touted as a solution to our energy crisis. Far more health problems with LEDs than the actual climate crisis is causing by itself. You've got to fix both but you can't do that at the cost of human health. Right. And I don't know if we've really driven home. I, I want people to go read your book so that it will drive home exactly what we're saying about this, what's happening in the body so that people will understand that we've got increasing, you, you mentioned cancer. You start with breast cancer or an example of your wife's best friend, actually, in one of the early chapters. Is that yeah. one first chapter, right? Part one? Yes. Yeah. And I, I think, I just don't know if people are really understanding because they want to keep their TVs on and their screens in front of them. So I want to just make sure that people understand what they're doing when they don't get the right light out during the day and the wrong light at night. What is happening inside of our bodies? Well, the, the evidence now, and it's rather striking, and it, it's going to really get the, we need to get the message out. The majority of breast, there was a mystery with breast cancer. Why did breast cancer, which was a pretty rare disease in women mm -hmm. up until about the 1970s, why did it suddenly ramp up fourfold, four times more breast cancer per women in from 1970 to about 2010? Why did it ramp up so much? And that was because it wasn't LEDs at that time, because that's before the LEDs came along. It's because we were using blue rich, very blue rich fluorescent light, which is also a problem. So fluorescents have a lot of this undesirable blue. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is pretty striking. So if you go to areas of the world where women are not, the women who don't, so the, if women don't see electric light or blue rich electric light, in other words, before fluorescence came along in the early part of the century. If you look at women who are blind in an early age, they don't get breast cancer. And if you look at parts of the world that don't have electricity yet, they don't have breast cancer. It's rare. It's a rare disease. So that, in fact, if you look at people who are not exposed to light, like in a lot of millions and millions of women are not exposed to electric light yet, that those women have about 20 cases per 100,000 women per year of breast cancer. If we go to the industrialized world in Europe and, and America, that's up close to over 100 per, you know, it was five times greater. So mm -hmm. there's a huge impact we've got. So that's breast cancer. And then again, you do it again for prostate cancer in men. One of the biggest, ca breast cancer, by the way, is right now is climbing at 13% of all women in their lifetime will get breast cancer. Prostate cancer is the leading cause of, uh, again, very sensitive to light hormone-related cancer. But even more, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. So a big study recently showing that people who sleep with the lights on at night, it's a remarkable number. Right. It's 30, 40, sometimes 50%, depending on the study, of people sleeping with the lights on in their bedrooms at night have twice the rates of diabetes, twice the rates of obesity, twice the rates of hypertension, blood pressure, high blood pressure. 
So th all these are impacts of getting the wrong light at the wrong time. People working night shift, we long knew had a lot more diseases than people who don't work the night shift. So those are key to understanding. So we got a big problem here and, and yet it's just light and we just take it for granted. We've got the switch on the wall. We can switch on the lights. We can turn on our TVs, turn on our screens. And our screens also, you mentioned, are also producing this blue rich light because it's the same blue pump LEDs. The solutions are there too. We've got TVs, uh, screens, computer screens now coming along, which remove that blue at night, but provide it during the day. So the, that technology has come along too. So that's part of the, this total solution. We need to manage everything that's producing the light that's entering our eyes. And it is the light that enters your eyes that matters. It's not the light on the back of your head or anything else. Um, you've got to be exposed to it. It's what's coming in through the eyes. And we know exactly the dosage you need during the day and during the night. And part of this book is the light doctor is explaining you know, how to get the light and also my latest chapter coming out on mm -hmm. Thursday yeah. is called, You Have the Right to Healthy Light. And I think we need to make that a slogan. In fact, I'm thinking about producing some t-shirts and whatever else, you know, I have the right to healthy light because we got to demand these right, this, the right lights because the lighting industry says, hey, consumer doesn't ask for it, doesn't want it. The science is sort of uh, not well established, which is a total statement. In fact, to combat that information, I I canvassed and actually I did a study with 250 of the almost 250 of the world's leading scientists, where we came out with a consensus about the, what was established, and a lot is established now. And that group of 250 scientists said LED light bulbs, the regular LED light bulbs, should have warning labels on them that say may be harmful if used at night. That tells you, you know, when the 250 of the world's leading scientists are telling you that we've got it. We've, we're getting into an asbestos scale problem. And that's another issue because that also makes the lighting industry pretty skittish. You know, what happened to the asbestos industry or PFAS or the other things out there? Mm -hmm. The only thing is, this is such an easy one to fix, right? Right. right. Change the darn light bulb. It's so <laughs> simple, right? And that's right. what we get to. But you need to, know, you need to be smart enough to know through you need to cut through the hype and unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation hype another reason of writing the book is let's get rid of this nonsense out there there's nonsense about a blue light hazard there is not a blue light hazard indoors there is a part of the spectrum not the one that's the sky blue part but but a deeper more violet more indigo color blue mm -hmm. which in very high intensities on a very sunny day you may cause damage to the eyes that's a blue light hazard but the light levels we have indoors are so low, there is no way that those levels cause anything. But again, that's one of the bits of misinformation. So we need a sophisticated public. But I am excited because I'm, you know, people are telling their friends, they're signing. It's very easy to sign up. I'm sure hopefully you'll have the, the link so people can just sign up. And my light, the website is called thelightdoctor.com. And you can, you, know, you can go to Substack and so forth and just search for it. But basically, it, the numbers are climbing, and it's really exciting just to see. And, and it's all over the world. The wonderful thing about Substack, by the way, you've got a totally international audience. Right. You know, I get yeah. new signups 24-7 a day. You know, they're clicking in at 1.10 a.m., 1.20 a.m., 1.30 a.m. Of course, those ones are coming in from Australia and New Zealand and everything else. But we've got a worldwide movement we're getting going. But it's high time because it's light affects all of us. It's, it's a huge issue. Right. And I've been, yeah, I will talk to, uh, to anyone about light that will listen. So I think that's really, you brought up some really good points about it's not that we're not in this danger because I think the blue light danger signal it gets spread around, but it's also, do we really need to be wearing the blue blockers during the day? Because it sounds like we're not getting enough of the blue when we're on our computers absolutely, and all that ab ab absolutely not the only potential time is when you're out in very bright sunlight in the middle of the day maybe that's helpful to have dark sun dark sunglasses or, or blue blockers but those blue blocker glasses really filter out very little light if they're if they're aesthetically attractive in other words if they mm -hmm. are clear they're doing nothing quite frankly right um, 
Yeah. Uh, and and the only time you need to and you don't want to remove your sensitivity to blue light. In fact, when I walk, best time to walk and go outside is in the mornings. You know, the yeah. early part of the day. I don't wear sunglasses when I'm out doing my morning walk. Uh, because I want the full benefit of light. I don't want to block it in any way. When I want to block light is during the evening hours, particularly right. three hours be before bedtime is the time you want to be really avoiding it. And so one of the things you've got, everyone needs to, you know, everyone's on a diet these days. Uh, we need to be on a light diet and know yes. what type of light we need when. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I want to just talk a little bit about mental health because I think your book will probably be talking more about, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to be bringing up more things about mental health, yes. but that's really kind of, you know, that's my background and my, where I see most people, I see a ton of anxiety that we just didn't see. And you mentioned people sleeping with the lights on. That is not as rare as people. I know that some people will think, what, who's sleeping with the lights on? But it's pretty common that people with anxiety, especially exactly. if they have anxiety at night, will sleep with the lights on, and that increases the problem. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so absolutely. I just thought you yeah. might have some things to say yeah, about there, that. There's a huge impact on, on mental health and depression and so forth. Fascinating study done in Scandinavia. Built a new hospital where half of the rooms were facing southeast and therefore got all the morning sun sunrise mm -hmm. and, and sunrise and you know the early part of the day and the other rooms were facing northwest and the people they were admitting with depression and psychiatric disorders were discharged half as soon i mean the, the, you know it, the people who didn't have the morning light stayed twice as long right in the hospital right. so and they're all being treated with medications and everything else but I mean, you know, you really start to tell you the powerful effect of light and light does so many things in terms of health. I mean, Florence Nightingale, for heaven's sake, recognized that people got better when they're exposed to daylight and sunlight and uh, the cleansing power. She wrote all about it in her books about how important it was um, as a sort of a, as a bi natural biological disinfectant and just making people healthier. So it's been known for a long time. Yeah. Uh, we got so excited by having all these lights and you know that we're we're turning on and with and the problem with LED is is light is cheap and people are using more and more and brighter and brighter and we're just making it so much worse is, yeah. is the problem. Yeah, and I see a lot of obviously teens and, and young adults that have that phone in their face right up till they go to bed. Right. And and it's and they're surprised by their immune systems having more problems and getting sick more and having more anxiety and depression and all of these, these things that they don't think are related right. to their life. Right. That's right. 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 Yeah. Is there anything else that we missed that you wanted to make sure that we, we cover with people so that they understand the importance of what's going on? Or should, is there more that we could talk about in terms of what people can do? to not change their whole whole life necessarily besides get outside well yes and and even having an office with a window you know people sleep better in who have offices you know if they're working indoors uh, near a window now more of us are working at home these days we have a chance to do this you can see a whole lot of windows behind me in my uh, in my office if you be in a room that's got that, you will sleep better than in a room that, that doesn't. So the key is regularity of schedule. Circadian clocks are built for a regular environment. Day and night is an entirely regular thing. So if your pattern is highly irregular or your uh, and so forth, then it's it's quite a uh, disturbing to your clocks and, and ill health results. One of the projects I talked about or research projects I talked about, fascinating one, in the second chapter of the book called Goodbye Milky Way is when a University of Boulder, Colorado professors there took out students into the wilderness without any lights, cell phones, electronics, electricity, flat, even flashlights, right? Nothing, right? And when they got there, they would stay for a week or so. And it was radical how much their sleep improved and shifted. And what was also fascinating was that some of those people were early morning types, early morning risers who get up early and, uh, you know, but then 
get get sleepy early in the evening. Others were these late night owls who stay up past midnight, but find it hard to get in the morning. When they were under natural conditions, those differences went away or largely went away. Mm -hmm. So it tells you, and we know this now, that some people are much more sensitive to the blue and electric light than others. Those light night people are much more sensitive to that blue light and hence, that's what's screwing up their rhythms and pushing them out of sync uh, with the world. And right. people get a lot of sleep problems because if you have to get up to go to work or do a job or go to school or go to class and you have to do that, get up and be there by eight or nine or whatever it is, um, and you but you can't fall asleep till three, you're running totally sleep deprived. Right. So it's again, it's really a matter of you know needing to understand that the amount of light we see indoors is of a thousand times more at night than we would see in the outside world. And it's a thousand times less in the day indoors than it is outside. We, we've just, we've got ourselves in a state of constant twilight, yeah. uh, which is absurd. Um, we can get ourselves out of this though. Yeah, we can yeah, get we ourselves can. out of this. It's, it's, and the light, and that's what we'll be talking about. So as this yeah. evolves, you know, I'm building the case. I've been showing the first part of the book is all about the medical problems, the health problems, what yeah. causes them, the clocks, how they work, how this blue light works. The second part of the book is how we build lights to solve the problem and how the inventions were made and what type of lights to look for and how they work. And the third part is where to find them, you know, how to be a smart consumer, right. um, how to, and then you can buy lights for your home, but what about your workplace or schools or hospital or uh, senior living facilities your parents are in, you know, how do you influence change there? And so we talk about, you know, how we actually can get people to change that and what is the case, how to make the case. Um, so basically it becomes a practical guide um, because we've got to, change the lights of the world here and uh, there are 2.5 trillion dollars worth of lights in the world staggering numbers of lights in the world that are mostly unhealthy it's a bit of a challenge but it's a very important one and it's one that everyone needs to do know and and become advocates for right absolutely and i just wanted to ask you since you mentioned the windows uh, my understanding is that our modern windows it's certainly better than being in a room with no windows during the day but our modern windows block some of the light that we want. So I'm always telling people, if you can crack the window, open the windows on the way to work, or taking the kids to school or whatever it is you do to, to get more of that light in your eyes. I don't even have sunglasses anymore, by the way. I just don't even bother. Yeah, no, I think that, I, I think the issue is uh, we uh, tend to, uh, modern windows, you say, do cut out a, a lot of light. Um, and we need to expose, need to, need to really get exposed. Now, you can do, you know, uh, this sort of thing that's too much damage and everything. You don't want really bright light in the middle of the day. Sunglasses are probably good then. But uh, you certainly, in the mornings, when I'm out walking in the mornings, I'm not wearing sunglasses. So, absolutely. So, it's, it's really a question of getting that very strong dose of light. And also, we need to design our buildings better. In the old days, uh, light was something that uh, architects were enormously conscious of, designing buildings so they weren't so broad and wide that the light could, couldn't get to the throughout the building. Uh, the buildings tend to be narrow in those days or have windows and skylights and other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, the whole history of architecture was trying to get light in buildings. Right. As soon as, as soon as electric light came along, architects said, hey, we don't have to worry that anymore. Now we can just light everyone with electric light in windowless rooms. That's when the problem started. Right. Exactly. So I know that you get your light environment right, because that would be really important. What else do you do that do you feel like nourishes your body, mind, soul? I don't even know if you believe in a soul, but your body, mind, soul. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, it's. Basically, having a consistent pattern of life, you know, regular meals and appropriate meals at the at the right time. Right. Uh, I'm a great believer in eating meals on time and schedule on some sort of schedule. Not obsessive. You can go out and relax and do things, you know. But basically, that you've got to because food, the timing of food is also an important it's okay. cue, mm -hmm. and it's a key. It's a secondary cue, but it's an important one. And uh, obviously exercise is important, um, physical exercise. And so the combination in the mornings of uh, exercise, light and caffeine 
is a great start to the day and that's a very healthy start uh to get you fully functioning then you know this when you're traveling uh, there are things you can do in terms of how to do your scheduling of you know when you're traveling um I'm I grew up in England so I get back to England pretty often and I have adopted a pattern whereby I'm a very early morning type I'm up at five in the morning uh, in Boston time which of course is 10 in the morning in uh, UK time so in England I turn into an owl I turn into a late night person right do you I'm up, okay <laughs> I'm up late right and yeah. I sleep in late right I, I I compromise a little bit but I'm saying I don't try to force that that, old, that schedule on uh, especially if you're there for a short period of time uh, in light when you travel and when you get exposed to light you're very sensitive light in the middle of the night and that's if you fly an overnight flight from uh, the east coast to uh, Europe if you fly one of those east coast flights uh one of those flights overnight you're you're arriving in the morning at a time when you're most sensitive to light and the best thing is to stay out of sunshine and the bright lights when you arrive because otherwise it, it actually hits the clock at a time it will send you back to the west west coast of the u.s time um, sends you in the wrong direction um, got it so there's a question that would have been nice to know before i went to england this summer okay <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you can really you know people get on that overnight flight i fly always fly the night flight uh, the day flights yeah, from the west coast from the east coast because then you arrive and you can then smooth into the you know in, into that new time zone so there's lots of things about that a lot of things about um um you know how to schedule your life and your well-being and everything else and it is important you know uh, nourish every part of you uh, and your faith and your soul and everything else uh, mm -hmm. it's really uh um in a well-balanced life that's really really critical right i agree couldn't agree more actually and i did have a hard time in england with the 4 40 a.m sunrise i'm a sunrise i'm up for sunrise no matter where i am yeah. It's one of my things. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it in England. Yeah. I got up at five. And where, where, where are you based, Kelly? Where I'm in Florida. So I'm okay. on the East Coast, too. On the East Coast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's, the challenge there is, you know, 440, think about it, is England. Be pretty early on your body clock time. In fact, it's a sort of time of day right. when your body clock is actually treats light as a signal to move west. So yes, it would be. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's beautiful studies. I interrupt you. The beautiful yeah. studies. That some people, if you go, if you travel a large number of time zones, like eight, you know, which will basically be from the west coast of the U.S. to Europe, mm -hmm. there are some people whose biological clocks shift towards Europe. Right? They shift eastward by eight hours. Others can't manage it, so they go. The clock goes sixteen hours. The other way around which of course takes much longer and mm -hmm. suffer really bad cases of jet lag for a long time because their biological clock is working its way to try to get to that new local time but it can't shift enough it can only shift westward you can shift westward by the way much more easily than eastward flying eastward flying westward is usually easier by the clock adjust faster in that direction so yes you can get up get to a point where you can get really screwed up if you don't know how to manage your light light and yet, you know, the airlines don't help us. Um, you know, hotels need to be conscious of where the traveler is and coming from. You know, we need standards for hotel. You need to know your what time zone you're going to arrive in. You can get awfully out of shape, shape pretty fast mentally. It affects your mood, depression, uh, just sense of uh, malaise and feeling in feeling not in good shape that you can get as a result of jet lag. And so, yes, and of course. You know, on an ongoing basis is very unhealthy in the short term. It's a you know really a struggle. More vulnerable to everything from you know infectious diseases, COVID, everything else uh, when your immune system is impaired. Right, exactly. And there are people who argue with me all the time about being night owls. Oh no, no, my clock is. I uh, you know they don't realize they're diurnal beings, and that they just uh, they think that they are nocturnal beings. Yeah, well, they you know people are different, and and you do follow their own schedule. But what we're just realizing, as I said, it's their sensitivity to blue light in the evenings, and so that's when very interesting studies you can give school children glasses at night that actually you know take out all the blue, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And 
and as a result they go to they fall asleep earlier they sleep better they perform better in school right and, and so forth so yes you can do that and um um some nice studies um you know all over the world people are doing studies like this showing blocking uh the light uh, uh and preventing that blue light getting to your eyes in the evening hours healthy and and uh, helps you perform much better and do better in school right exactly yeah we've got a long way to go but we're getting there i think yeah. we can your your book and you're getting the word out we're all trying to get the word out to anybody who will listen and people are interested i think people who are who have struggled with maybe their sleep or their mood or their hormones or their weight like this wakes people up to say all i have to do is change the light environment oh okay i can do that yeah. it's easier i think for people than some of the other things that they've been told to do oh yes no no i mean this is not not hard um not hard. and uh and and it's um it is and, and you know as i say compared to other uh, pollutions in the environment you know this is a, this is a pretty easy one to fix yes. um, once we get you know but we've got to demand this from the lighting industry uh, you know we uh, you walk down the aisle of home depot or wherever else and you just get endless lights all based on blue pump leds yes Again, uh, you know so this is part of the message get those lights available to us and uh, that's what i'm you know doing the book and really helping people find where those lights are and how to do them and how to judge them, whether there are true circadian lights, in other words, lights that are truly going to be good for your health or whether they are fake or false circadian lights. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of people out there changing the color of light and calling that circadian or changing the so-called color temperature, the CCT of light and calling it circadian. The answer is they do very little solve the problem. Um, but if we have lights that actually control the actual blue content, um, that's really key. Got it. Yeah. And so if every two weeks, another chapter is coming out. That's right. How long till we find out? <laughs> when are we thinking that we're going to learn about how to get the right lights? Well, it's going to, you're going to gradually learn as we go along. Yeah. And part of it is that the, the availability of these lights is a lot of new lights coming out as yes. this, this year, later this year. So uh, able to tell you of lights that aren't available today, that by the time I get to that chapter, there are. It's not totally um, uh, a matter of chance that I'm spreading this out uh, until right. through, the, through the end of the year. Um, right. And and it's also, it, it is, you know, the interesting thing about Substack, it is a, um, it's it's a great platform, very, a lot of great reading, a lot of good books in there, you know, uh, uh, that are being published there. But this business of building an audience is fascinating. You know, there are audiences there now that are in the hundreds of thousands of people, um, in uh, and and it gets the word of mouth gets spread around, um, and it's building an audience and building awareness. And uh, all the chapters are out there and available. You can people can start whenever. Um, but it's just, you know, on Substack, it's, um, you know, the, uh, the light doctor on Substack.com. Right. It's easy to find. If yeah. you go to Substack and you just type in the light doctor, you'll, it pops right up. Yeah. So, and I got the app so I can read it and I like listening to you. So I like the podcast. So I, I did okay. whatever subscription got me the podcast so I can listen to you too, because I like to hear you talk about it. Yeah, well, that's been a fun thing to do. And uh, yeah, and so I basically, um, you know, one of the things I'm trying to learn is do people, I, I, I've decided um, what I'm doing, as you know, is splitting the chapters into two, because yes. I get a sense that people might prefer, and I'd like to get your opinion, um, you know, keeping them between 10 or 15 minutes long, a podcast is more digestible than a you know, 30, 35 minute podcast. Right. Um, and so I've split them up. And so there are two podcasts per chapter. Um, but yes, no, that's been I've got a lot of good responses from that. And uh, very, mm -hmm. very exciting to see the number of people who are clicking through and you know, listen to those two. Yes, I like them short, too. But it also makes me feel good that I can get through. You can get through a lot of them and you feel like you've done a lot because they're shorter. And I get feedback all the time from this podcast, right? That people say, I want something long enough that when I'm on the treadmill, it keeps me there or whatever it is that they're doing. 
you know, the short anyway. bits are helpful. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Yes. So thank you so much for being on the show. I've enjoyed so much getting to know you and talk to you. And I think, you know, I will buy the t-shirt. You get that that merchandise. Yeah. I will uh, buy the t-shirt. Uh, yeah, we need to get those messages out. I'm thinking every possible way we get the message out. So, you know, and we need to challenge our hospitals. You know, why are you, you know, you, know, you go to a cancer center and they got blue rich LED lights in it. And you say, wait a second, what on earth are they thinking, right? right. Uh, and we know that hospitals, you know, the people, patients are coming faster from surgery when they got the right lighting in place. Uh, we know that all sorts of problems occur with this blue rich lighting. So yeah. why are hospitals, senior living facilities, School. why would they have a dream of this? Schools, everything else. Yes. So we've got to get a word out there and um, get a campaign going. And uh, yeah, so I think that's going to be one of the things we need to do. Got it. Well, we're on it. I'm behind you. Okay. I'm spreading the word. So Sorry. thank you so much. We'll make sure that everybody can click a link and get to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. It's been wonderful.